tonight. Let's just give him praise. Let's honor him tonight with our praise. Let's worship him in this place.
love you, Lord. We thank you for that name. There is just something in that name. The glorious name of Jesus. There is power in that name, but there is also healing in that name. That name covers us in Jesus. I thank you for that name. I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over all things, over every heart and every mind. There is peace in that name. Because I know there is peace within your presence. And I say the name of Jesus. I speak
so faithful. He is so faithful and so true. Jesus, I thank you for that name. I thank you, Lord God, for what that name represents and what it does, Lord Jesus, for the power in that name, Lord God. I thank you for that name and what it can do for my family, Lord Jesus, for what it has done for me, Lord God, that it is the name that guides my life, Jesus. Let it always guide my life. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Isn't he good? Isn't he faithful? Isn't he true? He is so good. Well, God bless everyone. It's so good to see you all here in the house of the Lord. I thank Pastor Sletton for letting me speak tonight. I believe that, and I pray that the Lord just blesses the words that come from my mouth. I want him to speak to us tonight. And before we begin, we have a couple announcements. We do have district conference this week. So Thursday and Friday in Grand Forks, there's a service Friday night, Saturday night. There's ministers training during the day. You are all invited, and we would love for you all to come for a great godly time experiencing the presence of the Lord, great worship, and definitely a word from him. So you are invited to that. There's another announcement that Easter is coming up, Resurrection Sunday. Everybody say, Resurrection Sunday. It's an awesome time for inviting our friends, our family. This is a day throughout the year that most people are maybe going to get out of their house and say, I want to go to church today. So extend the invitation. We want you to know that there is only one service that day. 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock on Resurrection Sunday, Easter, 11 o'clock. Another announcement is we have our Antioch Next Steps Luncheon coming up, or Antioch Experience. Now, this is something new, and we're extremely excited about it, but this is for any of you who are new guests who have visited Antioch Church or are in a Bible study with someone here at Antioch Church, and maybe we just need to know, what is Antioch? And what we want to do is we want to serve you. We're going to provide a, a lovely dinner and a time where we just share what is Antioch? What are our core beliefs? What is the doctrine that we hold fast to? What are the ministries that we offer here? And really, what are your next steps with God? So if you have not, in this room, gone through our new members class, you are invited. If you are a guest visiting, and by the way, I want to say welcome to our guests. If this is your first time visiting, we have a gift for you, but guess what? If it's your second time visiting, we have a gift for you as well, so please see one of our greeters so they can get your information if they haven't gotten that yet, and we have a gift for you. So before we begin tonight, while I have you standing, I'm going to have you turn to Luke 9, Luke 9, starting in 57. Luke 9. If you're there, you can say amen. All right, some of us are there. We will have it for you on the screen as well. Luke 9, starting with verse 57. And it came to pass that... As they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. I'm also going to turn to Nehemiah 6, short verse. You can just look at this screen. So the wall was finished. In the 20th and 5th 
twenty and fifth day of the month, Elul, in fifty and two days. So tonight, I'd like to call this message, Work the Wall. Work the wall. If we could, close your eyes. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are so good. You are so faithful. And we thank you for that name that we sing about, Lord Jesus, that name that brings new life, Lord God, and transformation, Heavenly Father. And I pray that over us tonight, Lord Jesus, that we can have a transforming and a renewing in our minds, Lord God, that we can walk and seek the things that please you, Lord Jesus, that we can follow you because you say, follow me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you minister to us tonight. Anoint the words that come from my mouth, Lord God, and let all glory and honor be yours. In your mighty name, I pray, Jesus, Jesus. God bless. You may be seated. God bless. In our opening scriptures, Luke, we have Jesus who has been captivating the multitudes speculations were growing about who is this Jesus. And we have these words of Jesus that just, well, I know they pull at my heart when I read them. Luke 9, 23 reads, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. As we read, many were following Jesus. Many wanted to follow Jesus. And we read of, the me of one man who says, Jesus, I will go wherever you go. But he says this without counting the cost. Jesus warns, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. You can go where I go. You can follow me, but there's a cost. Your home will be no longer. He gives the same opportunity to another man. Follow me. And the man wants to follow. He wants to follow. However, he has some things to take care of first. Suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus does not grant this request. He had said, follow me. And he replies to the man's request, let the dead bury the dead. Go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And then we read of the next man, eager again to follow. Lord, I will follow thee. But let me just go say goodbye to a few loved ones. Jesus said, follow me. And one man needed to consider the cost. Another requested to bury his father. Another wanted to first say goodbye to his family. These in themselves are not bad requests. These are not frivolous things. These are not threatening vices. These aren't sinful events or requests. But they are just as the days were of Noah. We read in Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in a field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage counting the cost, burying your father, saying goodbye to your family, not sinful things. Not things we need to ban from our lives. 
But what these things have the potential to do is leave us standing in a field or grinding at the mill. How many times from this very pulpit have we heard the enemy's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy? Well, here we go. If the enemy can get us distracted, even if the distractions are harmless in themselves, But if he can pull us away from God, prevent us from working unto and for God, if he can take our focus from light and place it on something else, he doesn't care what that something else is. He just wants us not focused on God so he can steal, kill, and destroy. We're talking about distractions tonight. And all throughout the Bible, we can list mighty examples of how distractions can lead to destruction. In the beginning, in Genesis, Eve was distracted by a beautiful fruit of which she eventually ate. David was distracted by a beautiful woman of which he committed adultery. Solomon was distracted by many beautiful women, of which he participated in idolatry. Abraham was distracted by his own fear for his life, so he lied to Pharaoh. The Israelites, they were distracted. They were distracted by religion, and because of that distraction, They missed Jesus. Martha, Martha was distracted. She was distracted with too much serving and became too busy for Jesus. Some of these distractions can be evil as they turn to lust and adultery, idolatry, fears. But by themselves, these things are not bad. A delicious fruit is not bad. A beautiful woman is not bad. Following God's law is not bad. And certainly serving others is not bad. However, if we allow those innocent in themselves things distract us from building our relationship with God and fulfilling our work in the kingdom, those innocent things become bad. There will always be distractions, and if distractions can lead to our demise, we must remove and combat any that come near us. A.W. Tozer stated, distractions must be conquered, or they will conquer us. Winston Churchill said, you will never reach your destination. You'll never go where you are intended to go if you throw stones at every dog that barks. And certainly, we should not take our time to set and and pet the dog. Luckily for us, we have a warning from God that we will be distracted. But God also provides examples of how to overcome the distractions. We can look to Nehemiah to help guide us. As we look through Nehemiah, we are going to discuss four ways tonight that we can stop distractions in our lives. Now, Nehemiah had been lamenting for his people for quite some time. The Israelites had been taken captivity by the Babylonians. The temple was burned. The Israelites lived in captivity for 70 years, as we know was prophesied. But the time came for the captivity to end. The temple was rebuilt. However, the temple was vulnerable because it had no wall. Finally, Nehemiah had been granted permission to go and build the wall. The wall was needed for safety. And I know we in here can attest that when we feel safe, we just live differently. There's just a different comfort 
that comes in safety. And I think it's, it's quite suiting that the name of Nehemiah means Yahweh has comforted. So building this wall was a big task. Building the wall was an important task to protect important people in an important temple. And the devil surely wanted to distract from the success of this task. And definitely, yes, he tried. But what we can see when we read about this is tactics to conquer the distractions, ways to overcome, ways to protect from, and things we can do ourselves to help us stop throwing stones at every dog that barks and keep moving in the direction that God has intended for our lives. If we go to Nehemiah 4, starting with verse 1, but it came to pass that when Sambalet heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth. And took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? He's really not asking questions here. He's mocking here. Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. We can read on, and we see that Nehemiah is mocked, and he is doubted, and he is despised. And I can tell you, as soon as you are on God's mission, guess what's going to happen to you? You are going to be mocked and ridiculed and despised. But Jesus himself says, Matthew 10, 22, and ye shall, not you might be, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He doesn't end there. He says, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. How do we endure? How do we overcome distraction? Number one, we overcome by setting our mind to work. Nehemiah was hit from all directions with mockery and despise, and he kept building. Nehemiah 4, 6. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. For the people had a mind to work. How did he build? For the people had a mind to work. Oh, the power of the mind. How many of us have heard or have said, well, The biggest problem I have is what's here. Between these two ears, behind these two eyes, I'm my biggest enemy. I'm my biggest critic. There is power in our mind. Our minds have the power to shape our realities, and our minds have the power to influence our actions. How many times in the Bible are we warned about what we put before our eyes? Warned about what we let in. How do we let things in? Our eyes and our ears. Why is there a warning? Because these things immediately impact our mind. So to protect ourselves, we need to protect our minds. We need to not have our mind control us, but we need to control our mind. We do this by continuing the work, the mission, the focus on God, God's calling, God's holiness, and not doing the things, the distractions of this world. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And Romans 12, 2 warns us, Be not 
conform to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In this world, we know we're going to be flooded by distractions. Everywhere we go. Just look at what Hollywood has done. It's more provocative, more violent, more gore, more veer from God's plan and God's plan for life. And the more they go, the more the mind is taking it in. And the more the mind absorbs, the more controlled it is by what has been set in. What about maybe just that music that lightly plays in the background? Worldly, ungodly music. Even the slow, subtle infiltration of the mind matters. We need to control what goes into our mind. Recently, someone who I dearly love was talking to me, and, and I don't know how the subject came up, but men are different than women. God made us different, right? This person who I dearly love was going in a bad direction, and she wanted to make a joke against men. Now, unfortunately, I had heard her say this joke before, and it was a crude joke, and it was very disrespectful towards all men. And when she said it to me initially, I had no reaction. I did not laugh. I did not smile. My subtle clue to her was, I'm not paying any heed to that. Let's move on. Well, now fast forward. We're having a conversation. Something came up, and I knew she was going to the joke again. And before she could say something, I said, I already know what you're going to say. You don't have to say it. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, that's going to be good. But she was persistent. No, you have to. No, I have to tell you. I already heard it. You already told me. And she ended up saying this joke. I didn't want it in my mind because I knew it was not what God wanted there. And I knew if I said something, I was going to cause an offense. But to perfect, protect myself in the future, I did say something. And I said, you know, that joke is putting all men into a category. And, and what I know is that God created man in his image. He created men in his image, and he created women in his image. So when we're disrespecting men like that, we're actually disrespecting God. I didn't want that in my mind. I didn't say it, but I didn't want it. Now, my response that I got was, you know, it's a really sad world when a person can't joke anymore. I knew there would be a fence, but I need to protect my mind and we need to have a mind to work. Number two, we need to set watch. Set watch. The threats on Nehemiah and his team gradually increased in severity. The mockery, the doubts, the hateful hearts lurking upon them now turn to conspiracy. Conspiracy to attack and conspiracy to confuse. Nehemiah 4, 7. But it came to pass that when Sambalit and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the wall of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set watch against them day and night. The enemy's new distraction was to fight and hinder, but Nehemiah's response was to set watch day and night. I will set watch. When we set watch, it means we have an awareness 
to worldly ways. We recognize that we are a target of whom he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we don't allow the new norms or the world's consensus to hinder or confuse us. What we do is we continue on that lighted path that God himself has laid out for us. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be sober, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roar, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Peter himself says, set watch. Don't be confused. Don't let things in that confuse you. You are seeking, you are sought to be devoured, so set watch. James 4.8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James, he, he doesn't want us. He's warning us, don't be double-minded. And here's the beautiful thing. When we set watch against the distractions and we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. Nehemiah continues on his wall building task, and the floods of distraction keep pouring in. Now it's his life that is threatened. Nehemiah 4.11. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. The devil wants to stop any advancement of anything kingdom-minded or that brings us closer to God. And now it was Nehemiah's very life that was at stake. But his focus and attentions did not waver. What did he do? Remember number one, he set his mind to work. Number two, he set watch. And number three, he set up boundaries, protection, and became unified. Boundaries, protection, and became unified. Nehemiah 4.13. Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. <laughs> We're not stopping. We're prepared. We're going to protect ourselves. We're going to place these boundaries up. We are unified. Now, this man was living on a mission. How can we set up boundaries? How can we protect ourselves? Well, we know the Bible tells us we need to suit up. We need to put on our armor. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Suit up, prepare, set those boundaries. Anyone in here ever go shopping and you're driving to your local establishment and you're looking for that perfect parking spot up close, especially when it's cold and windy, windy or rainy or snowy, and, and then you see the perfect parking spot and you're just about to pull in and then you see that someone had double parked, took up two spaces and took that perfect spot from you. Now, no one in this room is guilty of doing that, right, honey? <laughs> no one's guilty in here. But why do we do that? Because we're protecting and we're setting up boundaries. If we take up two parking spots, that's giving me safety 
on this side and safety on this side. Now that I don't have a minivan anymore and the doors don't glide and I have children that can open and swing the doors, oh, I have to set those boundaries and protect. Why do we do that? We protect our cars by putting space around us. So why wouldn't we do the same for us? We need to have say we need to double park in our lives. In all areas of our lives, we have to have space around us so that we have a cushion so we're pr- protected. It is okay to have boundaries. And sometimes those boundaries may be from places. Places that may distract us, pull us, tempt us, veer us off the path. Again, some of those places in themselves are not bad places. Like, golfing's not bad. However, if golfing takes the place of God's mission or your relationship time with God, well then, not bad turns to bad. Sometimes it might be restaurants. This food might be great. The food might be superb. The wait staff, amazing. But maybe in the middle, there's that, that bar that for some is seeking to kill. It's flaunting itself for some. And for some, safe protection and boundaries should be placed. What about our phones? I don't think I really need to say anything here. How can they suck our time, our attentions? Some things, very, very innocent. Some things, potentially not. But no matter the case, We need to set those boundaries. We need to set those protections. We need to go and park only where it's safe to park. And sometimes the boundaries need to be placed with people. Maybe it's people that have the ability to take you, like your mind and your actions and your attitudes, places you don't want to go. Nehemiah set up boundaries and protections. But... It was not just he who built the wall. He had a team of people. They were united, and they had to unite to build, and they had to unite to protect. Nehemiah 4.16 says, And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the Habergens. Now, I had to look this word up. It's just a breastplate or armor. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah, they which build it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, every one with their hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. Of the builders of the wall, some were there to wrought the work. Some were there to protect Some were there to oversee the work. Different roles, same purpose. And like them, each of us have a different role in the kingdom. Each of us has a place. Each of us are a stone in the foundation. And in order to overcome and defeat distractions, we need to be unified. We need to trust in one another. We need to serve one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to intercede for one another. And we need to not be distracted by what another is doing. But we need to recognize the importance of each member. Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. And every one members of one another. So we need boundaries, we need protection, and we need to be unified. The wall is almost complete. And the enemy, although all other forms of distraction have failed, throws in another attempt. Something innocent in itself, however not so innocent as it has the intent to destroy. They had requested 
a meeting. Now, the reason for the meeting is they had falsified some accusations against Nehemiah. So they said, well, Nehemiah, come prove yourself. Nehemiah, take yourself away from the job site and come talk to us. Distractions. A perfect while of the devil. But to this, as expected from his previous responses, Nehemiah kept working the wall. Nehemiah 6.3, and I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? And this leads us to our last defense tonight for overcoming defeating distractions in our lives. Nehemiah asked the question, why? Why? Why should I go? Explain yourselves. Number four, we need to ask why, or better put, seek truth, always in everything. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek. Why? Seek truth. Seek the answer because it shall be opened unto you. And we know that truth, the word, Psalm 119, 105 says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In our areas of distraction, we need to ask God's opinion in it all. We need to study. We need to seek so that we can stay on that lighted path. Nehemiah worked the wall with distraction after distraction and distraction and completed this wall in 52 days. And he teaches us, number one, We need to set our minds to work. Number two, we need to set watch. Number three, we need to set up those boundaries, protections, and unify ourselves with our brethren. And number four, we need to always seek truth. These are our weapons against distraction. However, Nehemiah did one more thing. Before any of this even started. Before the first mortar or whatever they used was stirred or laid, whatever you call it, before anything started, and probably the biggest and most important thing that he could have done. We can read about it in Nehemiah 1.4. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He lamented. He cared. He had a burden inside of him. And he fasted because of this burden He prayed because of this burden. When my husband and I were recently in the Dominican Republic, we shared the wonderful pictures of the building being constructed, shared the testimony of of church service and nine being filled with the Holy Ghost. And I want to take us there tonight. There's more to the story, obviously. There's lots that we could talk about that night, but... The service was concluding, and there was an altar call. And it's a tiny little building, and and people are gathered in the front, and there was a great presence of God. And, And this was a Holy Ghost crusade, so we just trust that God is going to fill those that seek and desire him. And where I'm burdened is at that altar, 
So I'm at the altar, and I'm praying with people, and as many of you know, I'm guilty of, but to me, that's the most joyous part of my day, is seeing people experience Jesus. And I was praying, and I was praying, and, and nine people were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And as I could feel the, the Spirit of God, I mean, he was still there, but could tell it was coming to a culmination, and, and I was just in peace and walking around. I, I started to, knowing that the altar, they were, they were done praying, I was walking towards the back. And I came and I saw there was it's a crowded building, so you have to look. And there was an opening where all the their little plastic lawn chairs that they sit in, they were moved and stacked. And there was a young girl sitting on a chair. I would say about 20. And, and she was sitting there, and there were people around her. But I saw as I was peering... And I feel the Lord directs us to people. I saw that she was throwing up clear liquid. And I was concerned. And then I saw her head lift up. And her eyes were not any shade of blue, green, hazel, brown. They were pure white. From her eyes, pure white. And immediately, in my mind, in my spirit, I knew there was something wrong. Immediately, I'll be honest, the thought was, she is possessed. I'd never come across someone who was possessed before knowing me. She's possessed. And so I, I go, actually, let me rewind a little bit. I want to share a little bit of details before that. My husband had a better firsthand experience with this because he was not at the altar. He was praying with people out in, in the chairs. And he was right by this girl. And the girl's mother or family member had taken her by her hair and was ripping her head and, and said to my husband, limited English, Satan, Satan. And was basically ripping her hair and smacking her face. Now, what I didn't know is also during that time, she was flailing on the floor. Banging her head on tile flooring. Didn't know any of that. All I saw was, here's this young girl. She's sitting in a chair. She was throwing up. She puts her hands up. What do we do? What do we do? We go pray for her, right? That's where my mind went. I need to go pray for her. So just as I'm, I'm inching through the people and I go to, to place my hand and pray for her, a distraction. The devil got into my mind. Immediately, what popped through my mind was the story in the Bible where the father had a son with gnashing teeth who was demon-possessed, who he wanted healing for, who the disciples could not make a difference in, in Jesus, and they wanted to know why. And Jesus said, well, this comes by prayer and fasting. So immediately my, my distraction was, number one, in all transparency, well, if she is possessed... Well, am I going to get? <laughs> okay, honest. But then the distraction turned to, oh, am I prayed up enough? Am I fasted up enough? The devil did not want me to pray for that girl. Now, let's just talk about this right now. Was the girl demon-possessed? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe she was just working in her flesh. But no matter what, it was a distraction by who? The one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
He saw what was happening. He saw the nine being filled with the Holy Ghost. And after I got the full report, what had happened is some had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Then the whole big commotion happened because the devil didn't want any more. So there were some that dealt with that. Luckily, I did not see that till the end. But I was, I was distracted. And as soon as I let this distraction in, and I mean, it was like immediate. Without me even realizing it, I used the strategies outlined in Nehemiah's building of the wall. Of course, at the time, I did not know that. I only made that connection in preparing for this, for this message. But this is what happened. When I had approached that girl, the distractions of fear and doubt and inadequacies penetrated my mind. But just as Nehemiah had done, I immediately switched and set my mind to the work at hand. What was the work? I need to pray for this girl. Next, I set watch. I realized this is just an attack, an attack I wouldn't allow into the situation. And then I set up my boundaries, my protections, and I unified. I did this by remembering that I am filled with the Holy Ghost. And no demon can possess me. And I am unified with my brothers and sisters by my side. And we join together for this girl. And finally, I remembered truth. I come in the name of Jesus. And there is power in the name. And all power and authority is in the name of Jesus. Now, in explanation, it seems like this must have taken forever to have these revelations, right? But it was instantaneous. Why? Because of that great overarching weapon of prayer and fasting. If we remember our introductory scripture of the three distracted men, one who didn't count the cost, one who wanted to bury his father, one who wanted to say goodbye to his family, all distractions, we read Jesus' response. And when we read it, he tells us that we need to stay focused and we need to stay to course. We need to build that wall. We need to eradicate our distractions. He says, Luke 9, 62, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Farmers, you're not looking back when you're plowing the field. We're not going to go straight. We're going to have some big, serious problems. If we are reaching, if we are feeding the dogs of distraction, we can become incapable of pursuing God and the work of the kingdom. If Sister Mackenzie could please come. We all, guaranteed, without a doubt, are going to have distractions in our lives. And the distractions may vary. Some may come in pretty little packages. It was, and it was. It was a good thing that Martha wanted to take care of her guests, to be a good host, to spoil her company. However, in her distraction, she missed out of what God really wanted of her. And like her, we can't allow the distraction to pull us from whatever wall, i.e. whatever calling God has in your life, whatever purpose he has for your life, whatever the plan is that he has for your life. We need to continue on God's mission, seeking God in all things, and we need to work the wall. If you could, please stand with me. Tonight, I ask, our 
are there any distractions in your life? Anybody in here have some distractions? Are there any things that are distracting you? Some may be innocent things of themselves. Some of these innocent things may be taking our time away from God, from his calling, from his plan, from his purpose for our lives. They may be taking us away from the wall that God wants us to construct. Where are we putting our time? What are we setting our mind to? Is work taking precedence? Is free time spent adequately? Are you so distracted by the ministries? And here's a good thing. The ministry is a good thing. But are we staying too busy and focusing on the busyness rather than focusing on the purpose, the meaning, and the one who gave us the wall to work on? And I ask, our greatest weapon Lord Jesus, are we prayed up? Are we fasted up? If there is anyone in here who wants a refocus, a refresh, a clear direction, void of distraction, I invite you to come now to this altar. And as a symbol of your coming, let that be a sign to whatever distractions there are that you are no longer going to let the distractions win. And in coming, you are proclaiming that you are going to work the wall. What is it that God desires of you? It's different for all of us. But I can tell you it's all important. He doesn't want to stop working on it. And so what we need to do, this altar is a place. Take it, Lord. Take this distraction from me. Hey, enemy, you don't have a hold of me. Lord God, I come unto you. Give me a wall. Give me that calling. Give me that purpose. Give me that plan. Restore my mind. Let me tell my mind what to fixate on. And protect me, Lord Jesus. Jesus. We are here for you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
ですが